All right, so equilibrium force that we did last night. Okay, just want to go over this before we continue on with today's lesson, which we continue on with dealing with equilibrium type ice, ice baby tables. All right, so equilibrium four. Here was a question that kind of puts everything together, even though uh, in the previous worksheets we were trying to do this step by step. So I gave you this question all at once. Will a precipitate form when you have a 0.1 liter solution um, that has a, a concentration, a molarity of 8.0 times 10 to negative 3 of lead nitrate, okay, when you add 0.4 liters of 5.0 molar solution times 10 to negative 3 molar solution of sodium sulfate. So what you're trying to say is when you put these two aqueous salts together, and they better be aqueous, we should know that the nitrates and the sulfates generally make very aqueous and soluble compounds, when you do this double replacement reaction or metathesis reaction, another fancy way of saying it, okay, where we switch the partners, will a, um, a precipitate is normally formed. So last year's chem class, you put these together, you did a double replacement, and you saw that lead sulfate, notice a plus two and a negative two would come together. Remember that a, um, a compound that's insoluble is normally have ions that are high, a positive and negative, just by your solubility rules would show that those things would stick together, prefer each other, rather than uh, dissolve in water. That's, that's a basic rule. But in any case, here's our precipitate here where we should be able to figure out the lead sulfate. Notice plus one sodium, negative one nitrate. You can definitely figure that out. Although this course is not about identifying um, precipitates anymore. However, you should figure out that that would be your precipitate, lead two sulfate. In any case, the question is, will a precipitate form? Well, a precipitate will form only when what? Okay, when your ion concentrations, the reactants and products, when the Q is larger than the K, and you have the reverse reaction. So what I did is did the, did the double replacement reaction here, and then I rewrote my ionization reaction. I know that the lead sulfate is over here and all of that, but I'm gonna pull this out, because we're, okay, and I'm gonna write it as an ionization reaction in standard form, something to think about here. So I pull it out, and this is what it's all about. I have my lead ions, my sulfate ions, and I have my lead sulfate, okay? And then I have an ice table here. Now, I'm gonna theoretically just start this problem thinking, okay, is the Q gonna be larger than the KSP? That's what I'm after here. So the first thing I have to figure out is that I need my KSP of my salt in question. The salt in question is the lead sulfate solid to aqueous ions. What did they give me? Well, they gave me the concentrations, and that has nothing to do with equilibrium. Those are just concentrations of a reaction. So in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, that's the values I'm gonna to use to, to get Q. The, the, the key to the question is, when the reaction reaches equilibrium, okay, with its ions, the, the uh, precipitate, that is the concentration of the sodium ions. Okay, that's the key there. Now, if you notice, that 1.588 times 10 negative 3 isn't in the equilibrium problem. Why? Well, because sodium, there's two what? Sodiums per one sulfate. So knowing the concentration of the sodium ions, okay, I can get the concentration of the sulfide ions. You can see the stoichiometry is everywhere in these problems. Okay, or you can see that what? For every one sulfate ion, there's one lead ion, or for every, I'm sorry, for every one, for every two sodium ions, there's one lead. In any case, knowing the concentration of the sodium ions leads you stoichiometrically to the concentration of either one of these, which if you haven't figured it out, has to be half, right? There's twice the number of sodium ions per sulfate ions. There's twice the number of sodium ions than lead ions. So giving me the equilibrium concentration of the sodium ions, I'm essentially giving you the equilibrium concentration of both of these. And because these are both one to one, it'll be the same value. So what did I do? I took my sodium concentration, I wrote it out nice and neatly, okay? And I said, for, here's my sodium, for every two of these, there's one lead, and I found that. And because these guys are one to one, in my ice table, Understanding if I had pure uh, solid, it would go forward somewhat. So I have zero, zero initially. My, my change is I'm going to be what? Plus X. I found my plus X would be because I'm going to assume I'm starting from zero. Okay? 
So there's my value. Now, you, did you need an ice table to do this? No, because you could say at equilibrium, I'm already at the equilibrium concentration. Right? I'm, I'm adding that from zero. So you could have thought this through and say, okay, this is going to be the concentration divided by two of both of these. And my KSP is going to be my products over reactants, coefficients become exponents, solids don't apply. So like all KSP um, formulas, it's just going to be the product of the ions to their respective powers since they're one to one, they're, they're both the one power. So I'm basically taking this and squaring it and I get my KSP. Okay, you need to understand what I just did here. Okay, I need to be able to evaluate my Q to my KSP. The top values are just Q values, those are concentration values. Whereas here is they're giving you insight of what the concentration of essentially one of the ions that are linked together at equilibrium. So I needed this. Okay, did you need an ice table? No. And as you go forward, you'll be thinking through ice table. Essentially, you're, you can't put something here because it's solid, can't evaluate. Here is zero, zero, or plus x, plus x, right? It's, you're going to increase these as you go forward a little bit. And we found out what the x is, and since you're adding the x to the zero, that is just it. But again, you didn't have to go through all of that. So I have my KSP, and that's what I'm going to evaluate my Q. Now, next part, I give you the concentrations of lead nitrate and uh, sodium sulfate. Essentially, by, gi by giving you a, uh, a, um, a concentration of the lead nitrate, I'm giving the concentration of the lead ions. There's one PB plus two for every two nitrates, but there's one PB plus two per formula. So this is the molarity of the formula. Remember, this is a like salt, so it's not a molecule. So this is the concentration of PB plus two. And since there's what? Okay, one sulfate per one per one of these formula, this is the concentration of the sulfate. So I'm good. However, the one extra step here is when you pour solutions together, you have to consider that 0.1 liters of the PB plus two solution, and you have to consider the 0.4 liters. You're putting ten, uh, point, putting basically uh, 100, um, 100 milliliters of the PB plus two into 400 milliliters of the, of the sodium uh, sulfate negative two solution. Well, when you pour them together, you're gonna dilute both quantities. So you have to dilute your values before you plug them into your Q formula. So that's what this was about. And this is classic solution equilibrium type problems that you will see. So, the, so I took, okay, and there's a couple ways you can think about it, but essentially you can do MV equals MV. What I did is I took the 0.1 liter, okay, and I, uh, what I do here, I, I did a fancy way to find my new conversion. You can do MV equals MV, but sometimes I think of it this way. I take my 0.1 liter. I know that the molarity of my PB plus 2 was 8.0 times 10 negative 3 uh, for a 0.1 liter solution. So what I did was I solved for moles, and then I divided my moles over the new combined volume. Notice... 0.1 liters plus 0.4 is that. So what I'm really doing here is solve for the moles and divided by the new volume. What I'm really doing here is MV equals MV. The molarity, uh, it's the same math, but the molarity was this, okay, the volume was this equals what's the new molarity at 0.5. So you could do MV equals MV here. And for those that don't see that, make sure you clearly understand. I just was being crazy and did it a little differently, but Remember, remember the dilution, MV equals MV. It's a dilution formula. And what I would do here is I would put the molarity of my solution, which is this here, and I would put the volume here. I'd, I'd solve for my new molarity at the new volume, which, which by the way would be the addition 0.5. And you get the same values, okay? Why does MV equals MV work? Because when you Multiply moles over liter time liter, you get moles on one side equal moles on the other. So I'm, I'm diluting both as I'm pouring them. And once I have the new diluted uh, concentrations, then I put them into my Q formula, which is the same as KSP. And what I get is a Q that equals 6.4 times 10 to the negative 6. My KSP that I found above was 6.30 times 10 to the negative 7. 
So this is essentially 10 times bigger. So this Q is bigger than the KSP. Visualize, guys. Visualize what we did. Here is my what? Here's my KSP. My Q is what? Bigger. So where's the reaction going to go? It's going to go backwards, okay, based on my reaction. So the reaction is going to go this way. And to answer your question, will a precipitate form? Yes. Okay, a precipitate will form. There's too many ions. The ions make the Q larger than K. So this is how you're going to be able to, you have to be able to present this. Now normally on an AP question, they'll break this up. They'll say, hey, what is the equilibrium expression? One point. What is the, the value of KSP? Another point. Okay. Then they'll probably, oh, they'll probably give you two points. They'll probably say, what's the, equal, what's the KSP expression? Just writing that's a point. Then they'll say, what's the value of KSP? And they'll give you two points in this question. They'll give you one point for taking this concentration for the sodium ions and doing the stoichiometry to get the concentration of these. They'll give you a point for that. And then they'll give you a point for solving. So that's going to be three points right there. That is, that is money in a bank. Okay, that's something you should be able to do. Okay, then of course, they'll probably give you a point for diluting, a point for getting Q, and then a point for evaluating Q versus K. So this essentially is a 10 point problem. I haven't figured out all the other points in between, but this is something you should be able to handle. Yes, you could have mixed it up a little bit the first time seeing this through, me giving it all at once, but the essentials of this are very, very important. Okay, I want, you, I want to go now, before we go on to other KSP problems, I want to go on to uh, equilibrium 6A because I want to talk to small equilibrium constants. So let's look at this one right here. Now the reason I'm doing this is because KSP is an example. <coughs> most of our equilibrium, most of our equilibrium problems, we're going to be dealing with KAQs that are very, very tiny. Why? Well, we have weak acids. Most acids are weak, and two, we have a lot of salts who barely dissociate in KSP. So most of our equilibrium problems are in KSPs and weak acids, as we're going to see in acid and base chemistry. And that's why acid and base follows all of this. All this stuff you can see fits together, right? Thermodynamics, equilibrium, I'm showing you, and kinetics all fit together. And that's why it's the greatest part of the year for this course. Now, we have, this is an example of a reaction that is not a KSP, although it is an, uh, um, an acid-base reaction, but the bottom line is I'm dealing with a KAQ that's very, very small. We all should know what that means. A small KAQ means what? And, and again, I'm hammering home the same concept, concepts. Um, what does it mean? Well, if I've got a small KAQ, it means that essentially my equilibrium position, my K, is really is here. And it's really hard to what? To have a Q that's smaller than K. Hard, very difficult. The amount of uh, reactants, okay, here is tiny compared to that. So it's, it's very easy for the reverse reaction to occur as we talked about. Keep that in the back of your head as we go forward. But let's, let's deal with this reaction here. So what they're saying, what is the equilibrium concentration of the hydroxide ions, okay, in a 0.15 molar sodium benzoate solution? Okay. So let's take this reaction and write it out. All right, I'm gonna leave out the liquid because the liquid has nothing to do with the problem, all right? The liquid, I can't deal with because it has no concentration. So I'm gonna deal with my, my benzoic acid here, which is benzene, by the way, with a carboxylic acid ending that lost an H. So we're dealing with the conjugate base of benzoic acid. In any case, it doesn't matter. So you have C6H5CO2. Two, and that's negative. Okay, and we have a double arrow. It's an equilibrium with the hydroxide as a drafter plus C six H five and C O two, which is the carboxylic end. Okay, now let's write our ice table. Ice, ice baby. 
And again, the ice means the I means the initial concentration. The C means, of course, the change. And of course, E is the concentration at equilibrium. And that's what we're after. We're after, we're after okay, what is, the, what is the equilibrium concentration of hydroxide ions? Now, what are we armed with in this problem? We are armed with the fact that KQ is equal to 1.5 times 10 negative 5. So KQ, or K, of our reaction is equal to 1.5 times 10 to negative 10. So I know this, all right? To solve for my hydroxide, I just have to know my other values. Okay, now let's see what we have here. They're saying that the concentration uh, of the sodium benzoate, okay, is 0.135 molar. Now, this right here, sodium benzoate, uh, this would be the negative ion and sodium would be here. So sodium gone, went by. So this is the concentration of the remaining ion here. Let's put that in. So initially, I have that. Okay? So I have 0.135 molar. All right? Sodium benzoate. Now let's make sure I have everything set up. The salt dissolves in benzoate ions. Except, okay, fine. Now, we're going to have zero here and zero here. All right? Yes? Do you have uh, Ms. Spano? Yes. Can I have her and her car keys for a few? Okay, sure. Now, we have the change. What's the change? Well, having 100% of this, okay, means that my what, Q is clearly ahead of my K, right? So therefore, the point being here is that there's going to be some forward progress here, right? Having 100%, okay, of my reactants, my Q is less than my K, way above, even though my K position's tight. So clearly, I'm going to go forward. That's important for you to see that. So by going forward, okay, I know that this is going to be minus something. We don't know that, so minus X. This is a one-to-one, -one, so this is plus what for each. Whatever that lose is, this has to gain. So plus X and plus X. All right. Now, what is this? This is going to be 0.135. The equilibrium is minus X and X plus, what's that? No, because it's a one-to-one. -one. There's one of these per one of these, one of these. So it's not going to split apart. It's a one to one to one molar. So think about this. If one of these makes one of these and one of these, if I have two of these, won't I make two of these and two of these? Yes, that's why it's a plus X for each. It's a one to one. If there was a two here, you'd make twice as much of this for one of these as you go forward. But it's a one to one. It's a good question. All right. Now, of course, here it's x plus 0 is just going to be x, and this will be x here. Okay, uh-oh, looks like we're headed down the road of what? Of quadratic formulas. Okay, but what I'm going to show you today is we're never going to have that quadratic formula. Okay, only if we have a scenario where k is big, we could have it. We won't have it in this course in terms of the test because we always deal with small k and q's, and let me explain. Let's go solve for this. So let's do the law of mass action, sometimes called the equilibrium expression. Well, what is it? Well, it's the product, so k eq is equal to the products, in this case, C6H5CO2 over the reactant, oh, I forgot the hydroxide, over C6. Why is this not C6H5CO2? H5? Products, right? Products. These are the products. There's an H on the top. What's that? In the first reaction on the top, there's an H at the end. The, I'm just wrote. I mean, here's, the my here's my product. On the top, no, it's the, the actual again. problem, not the one you wrote. Okay, so did I change my reactants? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I forgot the H. <laughs> yep. My bad. Yeah, it's a carboxylic acid, so there's an H there, my bad. 
So yeah, there's the H. I'm not going to change anything though. But here's the H. E to the is all that stuff. Okay, so now I have C6. I don't know what that meant. <coughs> Hopefully it doesn't mean bad thing, bad thing. C6. Should, should not be quoting Ebonics. H5. CO2. Negative. Okay. Okay. So products of reactants coefficients become exponents. Notice the water didn't go in because it wasn't a concentration. Okay. So what do we have? So what does KQ equal? KQ equals, KQ equals, so was it 1.5 times 10 to the what? Negative 10. Negative 10. And let's put the values in. For, the, for uh, this guy, it's x. For the other guy, it's x. And for this one, it's 0.135 minus x. And if you see, OK, to solve for this, you'll get x squared, and all of a sudden we're down the path of a what? Quadratic formula, as I've shown you and as you did for your homework. OK? But we don't have to go through the quadratic formula if our kq is tiny. Let me explain. OK? Clearly, we are going to go forward a little bit. Now, again, visualize this. We have a scenario where what? Okay, here's my, little, here's my little thing here. K is right here. Okay, you have a little bit of room in this area for Q to be bigger than K, but not much. The rest of the area is easy for Q to be larger than K and go backwards. Now, because I'm starting at 100%, this is going to go forward a little bit, but not much. It's going to go as forward as what? The KEQ allows. Because K is small, we're starting at 100% reactants. It's going to go forward a little bit, but not much. Because these values are going to be small, but I've got to deal with them. Here's the catch today. I'm dealing with this big value. I know that this is going to increase from zero based on how much is room from 100% of this to K. Now, so this, these values I want. This is important. This is where we approximate. This is very important. 0.135 is a huge number based on how much we're going to lose, correct? Are we going to lose much if my KAQ is 1.5 times 10 negative 10? It's going to go down, but is it going to go down significantly, you think? This is what? 1.35 times 10 to negative 1. KAQ is 1.5 times 10 to negative 10. Are these numbers even remotely significant? If I subtract this from that, would that be a significant change? No. So what we do to eliminate the quadratic piece, and we're able to do this and still get very, very good results, only if our KQ is small enough, we can approximate this x away. So what we say is because KQ is so small, because you're only going forward only a little bit, and we're starting with a huge number compared to how much you're going to lose. Is this going to go down much? No, because KEQ is so tiny, reactants are favored. So only a little bit's going to come off. And since you're starting with a big number, essentially you're staying the same. So we approximate this away. So this X, okay, right here, we approximate it away. By approximation, we say that that number is not significant enough. And so what that 0.35 minus x becomes just 0.135. So we're saying that number is too small to change that number. And we can check at the end if that's a good approximation. If you're within 5%, it's a good approximation. So now we can do this without a quadratic formula. Let's go ahead. Okay? When you simplify this, what do we get? We get uh, x squared equals what? Uh, 1.5 times 10 to the negative 10 times 0.135. Life is easier. Okay? Put this in your calculator. And what we're going to do is 1.5, second function, e, e, negative 10. We're going to times that by 0.135. And then I'm going to take the square root of both sides. Mm -hmm. 
and I get my x to be what? x equals 4.5 times 10 mm -hmm. to the negative 6, which, by the way, is a concentration of what? My hydroxide or my carboxylic acid. Now, can you check to see if your approximation makes sense? Yes, here's how we check the approximation. You should be aware. Find the value of x. And look at that, guys. 4.5 times 10 negative 6. Compare that to 0.135. Is this number going to significantly change this number? Point what? <laughs> 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 4, 0.000045 minus 0.135. Is that going to change that number? No. In fact, the way to really check the approximation is that we would see if it's within 5%. So here's our check. All right, let me just scroll this down. We would check this by saying, okay, take our 0.135, and we're going to see if within 5%. We put 4.5 times 10 to the negative 6, and we're going to see if, we're, if this is within 5%. So there's my approximation check. So I take my 4.5, second function, e, e to the negative 6, and I divide by 0.135, and I times that by 100 to get a percentage, assuming I did that right. What am I getting? 0.003%. So in my approximation, so when I check my approximation, this is my check to see if I'm within reason here. I get a value that's 0.0003%. What does that mean? That means that number is so small, it's insignificant based on what I started with. So when you're dealing with small KSPs, small KAQs, small KAs for, for weak acids, we're usually dealing with concentrations that are much bigger than how much they're going to lose. Since they don't lose much, they don't go forward much if KEQ is small, these numbers are always usually so much bigger than how much smaller they're going to get, we can assume this away, approximate this away. In this case, that 0.135 is so much bigger compared to 4.5 times 10 negative 6, which represents that x, we can approximate it away and simplify our equation without going through the what? the um, quadratic formula and doing 15 more minutes of work. If we did the 15 more minutes of work and went through the quadratic formula, we would not get a better answer. We would get an answer with more digits that aren't even significant. Look at guys, we're only significant in this problem to what? Two significant digits. They gave us 1.5 times 10. So you would get more numbers probably doing the quadratic, but you wouldn't get any more significance with 15 more minutes of work. And in an AP problem, you don't have time to go through the quadratic formula. So therefore, you can live by the approximation and it still works, it's still significant. And by the way, dealing with small values of KSP or KAs, we do this all the time. So this is something you put in your toolkit. So when you're doing your, 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 um, your KSPs or other equilibrium-based problems, small KQs, okay, we can get rid of that to simplify our equation. All right, let's put this to practice. All right, let's go to the next one, which is going to be KSP5. Okay, first question, or first part of this, in a saturated solution. What does that mean, saturated solution? That's a key word right there. That's just something from last year. If you've got a saturated solution, that means you have a solution that has maximum amount of what? Solute particles for the salt. So here's my ugly Erlenmeyer flask. Here is my blue salt solid. And what do we have here? We have the rate of dissolving equal the rate of precipitation. So saturated solution means you have a solid in a beaker that has reached its maximum concentration that can be held for that water or that solution for a what? Particular temperature. Remember, equilibrium is what? Temperature based. All right, now. 
First question. So that by them saying saturated solution, they're screaming to you, party people, that we are dealing with what? An equilibrium. Okay? And we have a salt, MGF. All right, they're giving the concentration, Mg plus, to be this. So what is, first question, write the equilibrium expression constant for the KSP and calculate its value. This is probably a two-point question here. They want the KSP. They want the equilibrium expression. So KSP equals product of the ions, Mg plus 2 times, now notice that 2 in front party people, so that's going to be F negative to the second power. That's a point. That's free money. You will get an equilibrium problem in your one of your one, two, or three questions. And you have question one, two, and three, and your part two, you will get an equilibrium problem. Will it be a KSP? It could be. Will it be an acid base? It could be. But most of the time they're asking, write me the equilibrium expression. Products over reactants, coefficients become exponents. Solids and liquids do not apply. They do not have concentrations. They do not have, okay, polarities. They're not part of the dilution um, derivation we had. Now, what's its value? Well, what did they give me? They gave me the concentration of Ng plus 2. Hello, stoichiometry. What would this be then? If the concentration of Mg is here, this must be what? This is x. This is... 2x. So if I know x is 1.21 times 10 to 3, this is twice that. Right? So we plug it in. Alright, so what do I have here is I have KSP equals 1.21 times 10 to the negative 3. This one is going to be twice that. 2 times 1.21 times 10 to the negative 3. And then, of course, don't forget what? The, the square. So this is essentially x, 2x squared. Okay? Do the math. Don't forget your calculator on that day. So 2 times 1.21. Oof, that'd be a bad thing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I have extras for you. At a small price. <laughs> yeah, I probably have an extra one. If I have to go out and buy one for you, it would. Okay. I would buy a nice one. Uh, second function to negative three. Yeah. I was about to say we could probably do small ones. Really small digits on there. Negative <laughs> three. Okay, so I get my KSP to equal, assuming I did it right, and that's always a big assumption sometimes. Don't want to make a donkey out of you. I got 7.09, oh yes, times 10 to the negative 9. And there's no units in the equilibrium. So KSP is equal to that. So that's at least two points. That would be three points. They give you a point for this. They give you a point for noticing that's twice as much. And they would give you a point for solving. Man, that's three out of ten points. To be on pace for a five, you need seven out of ten points, in my belief, of every one of these questions. So that's your four more points to pull out of this to be on track. Okay, next part. You can see it's an old question. Calculate the equilibrium concentration of magnesium plus two. Now we're in equilibrium of a saturated Mg solution 18, to which 0.1 mole of Kf has been added. Let me set this up for you. This is called the common ion effect. What do we have going on here? Okay, we have Mg, F2, solid, so we're not going to have any data for that. Equilibrium with Mg plus 2 and what? Two fluoride ions. Okay, now what are we adding? Well, they said Kf was added. Now, when Kf is added, they said Kf dissolves completely. Well, you should know better. Any alkali metal that's plus one in a big ion has a small charge density, which means the crystalline or the uh, what? The lattice energy is low, so it's going to be what? Always soluble. But they told you that, and they will always tell you that. 
So that means complete dissociation means what? That if I'm adding a 0.1 mole of KF, I'm adding a 0.1 mole of what? Potassium ions and fluoride ions. Now if you notice, there's no what? Potassium ions anywhere in our equilibrium expression. Our equilibrium expression is this and this. There's no potassium ions. So the potassium ions have absolutely no effect on this. However, there is a common ion. And last year we learned about the common ion effect. If I have a reaction at equilibrium and I add a common ion, it'll drive the reaction where? By adding more F, I am making my Q what? Bigger than my K. And now the reaction is going to be spontaneous in the reverse, correct? That's how water softeners work. Water softeners work by taking the ions in your, salt, in your water and you add common ions to drive them. Water softeners have to exchange out the cartridges that have the precipitated salts that come out of your solution. Any case, so what do we have? We added 0.1 moles of fluoride ions. We've increased this concentration. Now, we're dealing with molarity. They said assume the volume change is not anything you have to worry about. So I've got 0.1 moles in a liter solution. I can do that math. It's a one molar solution, yeah? Or 0.1 molar, I can't do that math. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> Here's my ice table. Ice, ice baby. Dun, 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 dun. All right, initial concentration. We're gonna make, we're not gonna evaluate this guy because he's a solid, all right? Now, initial concentration, well he said it was saturated. So I know this is hanging out there. It's saturated. And it's calculate the concentration in a saturated solution when you add. So we're starting with a saturated magnesium fluoride solution. So I have 1.21 times 10 to the negative 3. 1.21 times 10 to the negative 3. And of course, this one's going to be what? Twice that. So that'd be 2.42 times 10 to the negative 3. However, there's even a more, there's even what? There's even more, isn't there? Plus what? Plus the extra. What do we add? This is 0.1 moles over 1 liter. So we have 0.1 molar solution. So plus a 0 0.100 molar solution. Now, what's the change? Where are we going? I'm adding more reactants. The Q is larger than K. We're going back this way, so we're going to get bigger or smaller. Smaller. This one's going to lose minus X. This is going to be minus what? 2x. All right, what's equilibrium? Well, for this one, it's going to be 1.21 times 10 to the negative 3 minus x. This one is going to be 2.42 times 10 to the negative 3 plus 0 0.100 minus 2x. All right, we know our KSP, and we can plug this in. However, if I was to multiply these together, think with me, put this in, okay, here, and square it. Put this in here, multiply together, we're going to get a what out of that? We're going to get a quadratic. Take this 2x. The whole expression, square that, you get 4x squared times this x. Now you got, you're going to have a quadratic, a binomial, I guess, so what do you call it? What's that? A cubic, I think, which becomes really tough math to solve. You can do it, okay, but you don't have to. Why? Think with me for a second. I added 0.1 molar compared to this. Okay, what can I approximate away? What can I approximate away?
Isn't this too small compared to that? So we're going to approximate away this value here. Okay, now, we're also going to subtract a little bit away, right? KSP is really small, right? So we're not going to go that much this way, right? So I'm, I can approximate the, 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 how much we're going to minus, and I can approximate away this, because those values are too small, okay, compared. So I'm going to approximate this away and this away, and now all I have left is 0.1 molar and this value, and I can plug these expressions here, knowing why what? KSP is this, you can solve for your x, okay? And then you subtract that. Your homework is to finish this worksheet, okay? If you don't approximate, you've got some tough math ahead, which you can solve for, but you don't have to if your equilibrium position is swung all the way next to 100, almost 100% 100 reactants, okay? Without approximating, these things become very difficult in your time spans. Finish this for homework, please, and review with the key.